Another very, very important uh, use of uh, linear algebra is in solving systems of linear equations. And um, so if you're trying to solve the system of linear equations AX equals B, so let us consider a square system for now. The more general things we'll discuss uh, later, but for now we consider a square system and we want to solve AX equals B, but uh, due to errors, we end up solving a nearby system of equations, say A plus E X equals B. So, you can think of it as you, your, your knowledge of A is a little noisy. So you had A plus E in your hand and then you solved uh, A plus E times X equals B and let's say you got a solution X hat. And uh, what the question is, what can we say about the error is X minus X hat. Okay, so what can we say about this? So once again, if E is uh, the entries of E, okay, so if en the entries of E are small enough, such that the spectral radius of A inverse E is less than one, then we can do the following. We can follow an approach quite similar to what we just did, and we can write x minus x hat is equal to x is plus b, and x hat is a plus e inverse b, which is then equal to a inverse minus a plus e inverse times b. And now we see that uh, this matrix is exactly the same form as what we saw in computing the errors in inverses. And so we can use exactly the same uh, approach and write this as sigma k equal to one to infinity minus one power k plus one a inverse e power k times <coughs> A inverse B. So there is this extra B factor that's coming in here. So I don't need this bracket open. Okay. So other than this extra B factor, it's the same as what we had earlier. And A inverse B is just X. And so uh, this is equal to X. Now, uh, in order to proceed further, uh, see, I want to bound the, for example, the norm of x minus x hat in terms of this norm of x. So I need to find a way of connecting this norm of x minus x hat to norm of x out here, but then there is a multiplication by this, this these matrices out here. So for that, we have to use another notion, which is the notion of compatible norms. So here is the definition. The vector norm on C to the N is said to be compatible with the matrix norm on C to the N cross N is given 
a n c to the n cross n the norm of a x a x is a vector is less than or equal to the matrix norm of a times the vector norm of x so this is like a massa multiplicativity property of matrix vector norms so earlier this was a matrix product and you had the matrix norm of a times the matrix norm of b but now this is a norm of a vector which we are bounding by the matrix norm of a times the vector norm of b and this should hold for all x in c to the n okay then um, we have the following result so the question is are there such things as compatible norms it turns out that um, any induced norm is compatible with the vector norm that induced the matrix norm and this is a small exercise that you can show but we have the following theorem if is a matrix norm on c to the n cross n then there is some vector norm <coughs> on c that is compatible with it okay so there is always going to be one that is compatible with it ha ah, so how do you show this so first of all we'll define so this is actually what i consider to be a kind of clever proof so the very first step is to define norm of x in terms of this matrix norm and we're going to show that this particular definition of a vector norm is going to be compatible with this particular matrix norm and uh, so without guessing this first step it's a little hard to show this result so i will compute the matrix norm of the matrix where i append a set of n minus 1 0 vectors to this vector x to get an n cross n matrix and then i compute the matrix norm of that so i define this to be my the vector norm that i am interested in so is this a, a vector norm or not is something that you should check or show that this is a vector norm so it basically inherits all the properties of the matrix norm and uh, you, all you need to do is to show that because it's inheriting these properties of the matrix norm it's a positivity homogeneity and triangle inequality so then the norm of ax so this is a, a vector and i'm computing this particular norm of it this is equal to the matrix norm of a matrix whose first column is ax and all the other columns are zero which is equal to now because these columns are zero i can actually pull out an a and write this to be a times x 0 0 <clears throat> now of course the uh, next steps are immediate so you write use the sub multiplicativity and write this as norm of a times the norm of this matrix whose first column is x and all the other columns are zero and this by definition is the norm of x
Okay, so that shows that norm of, so there is always going to be a vector norm that is compatible with the matrix norm. But what I said earlier is that if uh, the norm, this norm is an induced norm, then the vector norm that induced it is a compatible, uh, is compatible with this matrix norm. So that is something else I'll try to show. Okay, so based on this, we have, we were looking at the norm of, so we, so to continue, we wrote that x minus x hat is equal to sigma k equal to 1 to infinity minus 1 power k plus 1 a inverse e power k times x. Okay, we had a inverse b which is equal to x. And so if we now take the norm on both sides, x minus x hat is going to be less than or equal to because the compatible matrix norm will satisfy this kind of submultiplicativity type property, but it's the submultiplicativity of a matrix norm with a vector norm. And then I'll further use submultiplicativity to simplify a inverse e power k. So k equal to 1 to infinity. Minus 1 magnitude is equal to 1, so I can just drop that term. Norm of a inverse e power k times norm of x. And um, if the norm of a inverse e is less than 1, then this, uh, the, the right hand side, okay, let me do it this way. This is going to be equal to norm of a inverse e divided by 1 minus norm of a inverse e times the norm of x if the norm of a inverse e is less than 1. So, so we taking this norm x to the other side, we have that norm of x minus x hat over norm of x is less than or equal to norm of a inverse e over 1 minus norm of a inverse e. And then we can use exactly the same arguments as the previous uh, a inverse computation to further bound this as k of a divided by 1 minus k of a times norm e over norm a times norm e over norm a and this will be true if norm of a inverse times norm e is less than 1. And of course, uh, there's the other reason, other, other point is that this norm is compatible with So you can't use an arbitrary norm on the left and expect it to get bounded by the this quantity when you use some other uh, norm over on the right. You have to use compatible norms on the left and right hand side. Okay, so um, uh, so we we looked at basically solving. I mean, we've solved a plus e inverse x hat equal to b, but 
In fact, there could be errors on the in the right hand side in measuring B also. This basically represents that you you don't have exact knowledge of A, but if there is error in B also, I can write this as B plus some error vector E, small e. Um, and then using the same procedure as earlier, we can write norm of x minus x hat over norm of x is less than or equal to k of a divided by 1 minus k of a times norm e over norm a times norm e over norm a plus k of a over 1 minus same thing k of a norm e over norm a times norm e over norm b. So this k of a appears in both the terms. So this is true if norm A inverse times norm E, we didn't make any new assumptions here, is less than one. And these two bars is compatible with So the punchline here is that the, the, the left hand side here is the relative error in the solution and that is equal to the sum of two terms. The first term is the relative error in E with the scaling factor kappa of A and this second term, uh, this is the relative error in the matrix A scaled by the factor kappa of A. And this is the re relative error in the right hand side, small e, multiplied again by this k of a or kappa of a, which is the condition number of a. So, let's just write that for the sake of completeness. Less than or equal to the relative error due to error in A plus the relative error due to the error in B. <clears throat> and notice that these bounds Okay, they don't directly involve the exact the solution that you found. So, um, in some sense, they are giving you a bound on. I mean, they depend on the actual error incurred, or at least the norm of the actual error incurred. But they don't have any direct dependence on a or uh, on x hat. So, there is a slightly different you can consider, which is that um, a slightly different. different viewpoint. Which is that basically we wanted to solve Ax equals B, but we computed some x hat where x hat is an approximation to x, i.e. A x hat is not equal to B. Okay, so we've solved something else, some nearby system, or we've used some procedure. We've got hold of an x hat, and A x hat is not equal to B. So we can define what is called a residual, which is equal to B minus A x hat, and this will be a non-zero quantity unless you've exactly solved this equation A x equals B. So this is called the residue. And then we ask, um, 
uh, what is the uh, what can we say about how close x hat is to x by looking at r um, of course um, a x hat is b minus r we will see so um, if i compute a inverse r that gives me a inverse times r is b minus a x hat which is equal to a inverse b minus a inverse a x hat which is equal to x hat and a inverse b is x so this is x minus x hat so this is the error in x when you so uh, the error in x is related to the error in r through pre multiplication by the matrix a inverse and so we have that this norm of a inverse r is equal to the norm of x minus x hat okay and um, so if this three bars is a compatible matrix norm with two bars vector norm uh, then the norm of b is equal to the norm of a x is less than or equal to norm of a times the two norm two bar norm of x which then means um, this quantity um, the norm of a um, times the norm of x over norm of b is greater than or equal to 1 if b is not equal to 0 so if as long as you're not solving uh, homogeneous set of linear equation b is not equal to 0 then we can have such a bound like this and then uh, because of this if I look at norm of x minus x hat this is less than or equal to <coughs> the norm of a inverse r which is less than or equal to norm of a times norm of x divided by norm of b times the norm of a inverse times the norm of r which then in turn is equal to k of a times norm of r over norm of b times the norm of x So basically, if, yeah, sir, uh, uh, should the norm of uh, x minus x hat be equal to the norm of uh, a inverse r? Correct. So they're equal, but just for the sake of writing an inequality, I write it. It's also less than or equal to. So I wrote that here. I think so norm of a a inverse r is equal to the norm of x minus x hat. But is this is also true? Although I, I'm 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 loosening it a bit, but I can also write it this way. So if b is not equal to zero, then uh, the relative error uh, between the computer solution. x hat and uh, such that a x hat is equal to b minus r r is the residual and the true solution uh, 
x, which is such that ax equals b satisfies norm of x minus x hat divided by norm of x is less than or equal to k of a times norm of r over norm of b. Okay, where the only thing to keep in mind is that the matrix norm gives uh, just a second. Yeah, here we didn't use any 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 rule like uh, the norm of A inverse E should be less than one or any such thing. This is a different formulation. There is no E matrix here. So the only thing we used was that um, where the matrix norm used to compute K of A is compatible with the vector norm. So, but anyway, the thing is that again, it brings out the fact that well-conditioned are good matrices because the amplification to the relative error in in B uh, is is going to be small. But if the matrix is ill-conditioned, it is possible that the relative error, the the error, the relative error in X hat can be large, much larger than the error in relative error in the residue. So you may think that you've solved it very accurately because AX hat is very close to B, but the error in X hat itself could be much larger than that if the matrix is poorly conditioned. Okay, so um, I think there is just one more way to analyze the sensitivity of linear systems. Um, let me see if... Um, I can cover that today. Okay, so um, at least I can maybe start it, give you an indication of how it So another way. So the, the way it works is like this. So we consider a perturbed system. And um, so let epsilon be some small number greater than zero. And A plus epsilon times an error matrix A delta times X of epsilon is equal to B plus epsilon B delta. So here A delta and B delta are some fixed matrices. But what we say is that, let's suppose that the A in our hand is A plus some small number epsilon times this A delta, and the B in our hand is B plus some small number epsilon times this B delta, and corresponding to this linear system of equations, or system of linear equations, we compute a solution to the linear system, and we call it X epsilon. And now we can try to look at how close x epsilon will be to x as epsilon starts becoming smaller and smaller. So that means that we are perturbing this matrix by a smaller coefficient times this a delta and we are perturbing the observations b by a smaller and smaller coefficient times this b delta and we want to know if very very small perturbations can lead to large errors in x that is x epsilon minus x is going to be a big number still. So um, now the, there is a scalar epsilon throughout this thing, so we can actually differentiate this with respect to epsilon. So 
So what I get then is, um, I have to use chain rule here. So A plus epsilon A delta times, there is some derivative x dot of epsilon. This is the derivative of the solution, which is a function of this epsilon. And this plus A delta times x of epsilon. So I'm differentiating. So what I have on the left hand side here is a, a vector. And what I have on the right hand side is also a vector. So I'm differentiating a vector with respect to a scalar epsilon, which is the same as differentiating each entry of the vector with respect to the scalar epsilon. And so this time plus, so if you do that more carefully, you'll see that what I'm writing here is exactly correct. So this is equal to B delta. So for example, if I take the ith component of this and differentiate it with respect to epsilon, the ith component is bi plus epsilon b delta i. And if I differentiate that with respect to epsilon, I'll get b delta i. And so that's why this whole vector on the right hand side is just b delta. So which means that when epsilon is equal to zero, we have uh, x dot of epsilon when epsilon equals zero is actually equal to uh, A inverse times B delta minus A delta times X at epsilon equals zero, which is equal to X, which is the true solution. So we can use this derivative to expand x of epsilon in a Taylor series around zero. So what we get is x epsilon minus, or this is equal to x at zero plus epsilon times x dot at zero plus some term which is O of epsilon squared. So we have that x of epsilon minus x of zero, which is actually equal to x, um, is equal to epsilon x dot of zero, which is A inverse B delta minus A delta x. then plus this second order term O of epsilon square. So then we have that um, norm of x epsilon minus x is equal to the norm of this quantity, which I will use uh, again triangle inequality. Or actually, this O of epsilon squared, when I write it like this, this is a vector whose entries are all scaling with uh, scaling down as epsilon squared. And so when I take this uh, triangle inequality on it, I'll get the norm of O of epsilon squared and the norm of a vector whose entries are all of order epsilon squared is also of order epsilon squared. And so this actually is less than or equal to the norm of epsilon A inverse B delta minus A delta X plus a term that is still O of epsilon square. And now again, we'll consider compatible norms. Such that A B is less than or equal to the matrix norm of A times the vector norm of B. So then we can write this right hand side as being less than or equal to epsilon norm of A inverse norm of vector norm of B delta minus A delta times X plus still this O of epsilon square. Which in turn, I can bound as less than or equal to um, epsilon times norm of A inverse, 
and I'll use triangle inequality and then submultiplicativity here and write this as norm of B delta. And I'm using triangle inequality, but then I have to use plus because I'm taking norm inside and the mod of minus one is plus one. So plus, and then since it's additive term, I can use the uh, use this property one more time to write this as norm of a delta times the norm of x plus o of epsilon square. Means epsilon. is less than or equal to, and as usual, I can insert, multiply and divide by norm of A, epsilon times norm of A inverse, times norm of A, times B delta, so I have to divide by norm of A, so norm of B delta, divided by norm of A, times there is a norm X from here, so divided by norm of X, plus the norm of A delta. The norm of X cancels, but I will be left with the norm of A sitting here. Again, plus O of epsilon square. Dividing by norm of A and norm of X doesn't change the epsilon dependency here. Uh, and so this in turn, um, so basically again, use this compatible norm thing. So. So AX equals B implies norm of B is less than or equal to the matrix norm of A times the vector norm of X. So this is a bigger number. So if I replace the denominator here with norm of B, that will only increase this quantity. So the, my bound is not affected. So the, uh, this X of epsilon minus x over norm of x is less than or equal to epsilon. This quantity here is k of a times norm of b delta over norm of b plus norm of a delta over norm of a plus o of epsilon square. So this is nice. You can see that it's showing how, whoops, it's showing how the relative error in X of epsilon is related to the, oops, something happened. I'll fix that and what happened here? Ah, here we go. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, this quantity is the relative error in B. This quantity is the relative error in A. And this is the condition number. And so it's showing how the relative error in the solution depends on the condition number times the relative error in B plus the relative error in A times this epsilon itself. Okay, so we'll stop here for today and continue on Wednesday.